Good to see you guys, Greg. I have to say I've used um SU host. I don't I don't know if you call it SU host, but uh the for like 10 plus years now, ever since I was at Stanford and love it. So it's amazing to meet the creator in person. Wow. Thank you so much for telling me that. I, I saw that you were the president of Basis. Could I was. That was my foray into um, host startups because uh, I'm I'm from Kentucky uh, originally, and there's not that many people that I think do startups in Kentucky. So my view of what it means to start a company was that you would get a loan from the bank and then maybe open a restaurant that is more than likely to fail in two years. So it was like this idea of like, why would anyone go and do that? And it was actually through basis that I think I got um, a like a look into like, what does it mean to actually start a, a startup? And I, I got into basis because I was really interested in social entrepreneurship and actually took time off when I was at Stanford to work at an NGO in Kenya. And that's why I never ended up graduating at college. So, oh, you I, I thought you had finished computer. No, science. I'm, I'm a dropout. So between my uh, my husband and I, he has two degrees from Stanford. I have zero. So on average, we have one. But uh, yes. Amazing. C could you walk us through your journey of like becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah, I feel like it's um because uh, I think that for for no one it's like ever a straight path. So as I mentioned, originally from Kentucky, came out to the Bay Area for college, and then um, got into like I would say startups and entrepreneurship because there there wasn't even a word in my mind of like entrepreneurship. What does it even mean? But it, it seems like it's basically just like creating something when nothing actually exists got interested when I was um, in basis and they would have all of these speakers come in and that would talk about like companies they built. And I think this is one of the special parts about being at Stanford. Everyone is in that startup and entrepreneurship ecosystem. So when like the guy down the hallway from you is like starting a company, you're like, wait a minute, I'm in class with that person and they're not that good. It's like, maybe I should go and do something as well. I, I could do it too, feeling. Yeah. Uh who who are some people in particular that inspired you that that made you believe that you could do it or, or, or so one of the things was like um basis of the time would organize startup school with um with Y Combinator and I didn't even realize how big of an opportunity it was because it was like rock paper scissors with my co-president uh, basis for like who's going to take on this admin task of working with Paul and Jessica directly of organizing startup school um, and I lost the bet. So that's when I ended up working actually with them. There are other things that I think we both wanted to work on or then organize like a conference. But that was such an amazing opportunity. And this was actually why I ended up uh, dropping out of college because I had the early exposure to Paul and Jessica of like, of meeting with um, Jessica in particular. And she was like, I think more people should do startups. She's like, Yen, what are you thinking about doing after college? And I was like, oh, well, I have this offer to go to McKinsey. She's like, why would you go to McKinsey? You should go and start a company. And in my mind, I was like, I guess maybe I hadn't thought about it, but maybe I should give it a try. And I think there's something about like when you're um, young and a college grad and you don't know how hard it is that actually allows you to take that leap. It's like, great, if you need to get to ramen profitability, I liked ramen. So it was like, that doesn't seem that hard. And, and maybe if you know too much about how difficult it is, like now knowing what I know to actually start a company, I think I would actually like probably overthink it. But the time I was like, why not go and take that leap and and go and try something as well. And the fact that it came from Jessica, uh, did it have even more weight in, in yeah. a way because she you could identify with her as a woman or it absolutely had so much weight. I mean, the funny story was like when we applied to, to YC, they used to have this question. I don't know if they still do now of like name a system or like something that you've hacked, not like a computer thing you've hacked, but like what is something that where you, you got around? And the thing that I actually share was that year when we were organizing startup school with YC, we didn't get the approval to use the conference hall until literally the day before. So my backup plan, knowing nothing, this would have been a really bad plan, was just to sleep in the conference hall and then open the doors in the morning and assume nothing bad would happen. Luckily, we got the approval, everything worked out. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness that's the way it actually ended up turning. But um, I think that I uh, have so much respect for Jessica. And I think she doesn't nearly get the credit that she deserves in, 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 in kind of starting YC. And one of the things I think that she really did is like, um, help people see that like there's a view of what you think a founder is when really a founder can be anyone that has like a crazy idea that wants to create something from zero to one and you should just go and try it. Um, there's like nothing that's stopping you other than maybe your your own doubts or fears. So wait, explain what basis is because the rest of the world, you guys are both from Stanford. Yeah. I'm a letter from Stanford. Explain what basis is and what it was. It sounds like it was like instrumental and you're like changing your whole life. Like 
It was such a great, it's a, it's called, BASA stands for a Business Association of Student Entrepreneurs, or maybe Stanford Entrepreneurs. I don't know what that S stands for, but um, the, uh, it's a student group um, for startups and entrepreneurship. And uh, some of the things they did was like organized startup school at the time. They have like a uh, startup competition where you could pitch and get funding for the startup. Um, uh, they brought guest speakers that were starting companies. And I think what was pretty key for me was like, uh, you got access to a lot of people that were doing really cool things. So, um, I think that one of the things I, I, I knew to on sometimes is like, like when you're being a founder is that I think it's like the only career path that you take where if you want to be a founder through multiple companies that intentionally you are starting from scratch every single time. Say that you decide that you want to be like a VP of engineering. Great. There's a career ladder that you go. And if you're a VP of engineering at Google and you apply to Facebook, you're not going to come in as an intern. You're going to be VP of engineering again. But if you're a founder, there's no shortcut. Like say that you have a massively successful exit and you decide to start another company. You're starting from ground zero because you can't shortcut product market fit. You can't shortcut the building of the company. So you are actually choosing to go from CEO to like, again, technically a CEO if you start a new company, but you're CEO of like two people. So you might as well be an intern. And I think that through basis, I got exposed to a lot of founders that had gone through this journey. And I was like, wow, you mean that you can actually get other people to fund your crazy ideas and you can try it and then see if you can build something that doesn't exist. That sounds like fun. Let's go and see if we can do that. Okay. So basis uh, introduced startup school to Stanford, right? So you guys got them in to Stanford yeah. Hall. When was this? Like what time frame? 2000 something. This was, um, so I, I did basis when I was a junior and senior year. So this was like back in 2010, 2011. Yeah. Was this with Mark Zuckerberg? Was that the big one or prior to that? Oh, I think that, I don't know if Zuck was um, the the speaker in that series. I remember like Brian Chesky came and talked about Airbnb as well. And the other cool thing is like, um, they also bring in speakers that talks about now just like massively successful businesses, but things that may not have gone well, like Dalton Caldwell, who is now a partner at YC, he was actually my partner when we went through recently with my my startup Pulley. Um, but he talked at startup school about like, hey, here's a company that I worked on that didn't go well. Here are some of the lessons that we also learned. Because I think there's two sides of it. There's the companies that do really well. And then there's also like, hey, sometimes the market shifts and you don't do as well as what you expect going in. And you have, okay, cool. You had Dalton as a, I went through YC. I know, I know Dalton. So and, yeah. And- the startup school uh years ago when they had all of these speakers so i had no idea you were one of the organizers which is way cool doing that okay so you went through startup school i guess you were talking to like brian chesky and all these well-connected people like dalton like that must have been like a life-changing moment like doing those events with them because they were really but the thing is like i don't think you know that when you're in college because i like if you think about to like you in college when you say like a life-changing um moment I don't feel like you even like recognize that you're kind of like, okay, awesome. You built this cool company. Okay. And then I don't know. And then it's like, I have finals <laughs> like next week. So your mindset also like quickly changes. Um, and I think maybe it's like that also like normalize the aspect normalize, I think maybe is a wrong word, but made it accessible. This aspect of like, wow, these people that you really look up to, these people that are creating the things that you're using, um, they're just real humans in some ways. So it's like, and there's, there's nothing that's like really exceptional about them. And I think it, it shifted this gear from like, wow, you, you have to be like this good to be a founder to like, actually, this is something that um, anyone can also do. And uh, after I made the decision uh, to drop out and start a company, and part of this was from a conversation with Justin, who's like, well, why don't you just go and start a company? I had one semester left because I took time off when I was at Stanford to work at an NGO in Kenya. And instead of finishing out that one semester, I was like, why not? It's like, apply to YC during the summer, do it. And then it's like, let's just keep going. Um, and I think that was, once I decided to do the founder route, realized like how difficult it was. I think sometimes there's this perception that you have of a startup that you can get from reading TechCrunch of like, everything is up and to the right. Everything's amazing. If you're on Twitter all the time, you have this perception of like, wow, it's so easy to serve. Everyone is bragging about it. But then when you're actually in the thick of it, you realize like how difficult it actually is. Could you tell us about the inspiration behind creating Pooley? Um, and I know Daniel is a yeah. user. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Uh, Give us feedback, please. Tell me all the things that don't work for you because then we'll we'll make that better. Um, especially for, like, you know, you're, you're competing against Carta and other totally. college players. 
I think inspiration for recruiting probably very much came from, I would say, my own experience as a founder. Like when you're a college grad, drop out, trying to start a company, you don't know anything. Um, the, uh, I felt like there were so many things that you were doing from the zero to one where it was just really confusing the first time around. And if you really think about it, equity is that single asset your company has that is more valuable than anything else. Um, it is the only thing that can a thousand X in value. Um, but the way they think about managing equity for me, especially was like, completely a black box when you're fundraising. How much of the company are you actually giving away? These terms were also really confusing because here I am a founder raising funding for the first time against an investor where this may be like their fifth pitch of the day. And this is your only company. When you're thinking about using equity as a lever to go and hire really great talent, it didn't feel like you had really good tools to help you even understand how much equity do you give away to your early hires. So with Pooley, our aspiration is has always been, it was like, it's not just about managing equity on a spreadsheet, but how do we help people also make better decisions around their equity? For founders, especially like you're working at your startup because of the equity. So how do we help you like leverage in the best way to go and do something awesome? Um, so that was a large part of the inspiration because when I used other tools, it didn't feel like they were built for me. It felt like they were built for cap table administrators or, or paralegals, not for the founder who is uh, doing the zero to one really hard work. Can you talk about how you're, uh, you you support your mission of of emphasizing sort of equity insights instead of just recording equity no. as an accountant? Like, how could you expand on this? When, when we started Pulley, um, we uh, I, I I went through YC, and um, uh, part of the reason for going through YC was that we knew that this class of users would also be our ideal target demographic. I went through YC three times, so like even though the partners are amazing, I would say the third time around maybe not for like the amazing advice because you learn enough, I would say the first and second time. But we also knew that we had amazing access to like a group of users that could help us stress test the product really early on. And there's no shortcut for that. Um, so I would sit down with founders and just help them on board and help them walk through some of the questions they had from fundraising. And they would ask me, it was like, hey, there's like, I'm thinking about raising like a million and $10 million post. And this investor is asking for pro rata with an MFN. What does it mean? Great, let's model this out on Pooley so you can actually know how much of the company you're giving away. When I asked folks, it was like, do you know how much of the company you even own? You'd be surprised at how many people come back and don't actually even know the answer to that question. And why does that even matter? That matters because when you're raising future rounds of funding, investor also wants to know is like you're actually vested for the long term. If like by the Series B, you own 5% of the company, well, are you actually going to stick around? So ownership does matter for future success of your company. So with Pulley, we actually give you the tools to great input all your term sheets, input all the uh, different fundraising notes that you have. So you can even understand how does it affect your fundraising today and into the future tool. And there's other things that we're doing around compensation that we are working on today and we'll be excited to share in the future um, that I think can even further kind of this mission around how do we help founders like answer questions around equity far more when it comes to employee compensation. Yeah, Daniel, actually, I wonder if you could speak about your, your use of pulley, like what your impressions were. I mean, I'm actually really, I would say more sophisticated than the average like first time founder because I had a company and I so you know sold it and um I understood cap tables. So I was pretty uh, arduous in like looking for like a partner that I really wanted to like work with uh, this time around. And you know, in the past they used to use Excel sheets, like lawyers would use yeah. Excel sheets, and it was actually kind of complicated. And it was a, you know, it's a slower process because you have to ask the lawyer to do an update, the lawyer would do an update, you get your cap table back and, you know, or you, you're internally, you, you manage the cap table, but it would all be in Excel. Like, that's just the way that things were done, like in the earlier years. And then all of a sudden, like the cloud and, and cap tables went to the cloud. I, I started to follow like the new in startups out there. And honestly, I really like your startup, uh, Yin, just because it's honestly very founder driven. And I really like that a lot. I'm like, you're very much pounding the pavement. I looked at like the funding. I looked at like you as a person, like your three-time founder, you've done this before. And then I looked at the product and the product was amazing. And I'm like, all right, this is clear to me. I got to become a user of this. And honestly, it has helped enormously in our startup already where we've raised. That's amazing to hear. That's like one of the best things to hear. Um, I feel like uh, the... And when you say like Poly feels very founder focused, I'd say that's not by accident as well. Because um, when I started companies in the past, like we went through a number of pivots. Uh, happy to talk about that. But like when I first dropped out, I was like, we started by doing something that was an ad tech, ended up pivoting to um, 
disappearing text messages, because around this time, Snapchat was getting off the ground, to pivoting to same-day laundry delivery. I would say like the same-day laundry delivery business is actually the hardest company I've ever run. So like any software business pales in comparison to something that you have to do where you you have to physically deliver a good and have to be boots on the ground. I did laundry for a long time. But it was um, after that experience, it was also one that made me realize where a lot of times you talk about what's the market you want to be in? What's the product that you want to build? Why is now a good time? All of these are critical questions. And as an angel investor, I ask um, founders these questions, but there's almost like an even more important one of who do you want to help? And that really matters because you need to be obsessed with your customer. You need to be obsessed with the persona you're building for. I realized when we were doing prim or laundry startup, like I honestly was not obsessed with like either laundry mats or like our customers that were upper middle class people that were short on time that needed laundry delivery. I love talking to founders. Um, I love thinking about how do we actually make their jobs a little bit easier because I've been in their shoes. I know how hard it is. And the idea of like supporting people that are trying to do this crazy, ambitious task is so exciting. It's why we even named the company Pulley. Uh, Pulley is a simple machine that can make it easy, a little bit easier to do seemingly impossible task of starting a company. So like for me to, to like think about building a product for founders and spend all days like talking with founders, like you don't even need to pay me for that. I That's just really fun. I know you've had uh, substantial growth uh, recently, tripling your revenue in, in just a year. And I'm wondering what you attribute to this level of success, rapid success. I think, well, I mean, the uh, I'd say a couple of things. One is, and thank you, is like, um, it's also just like really hard. And maybe this is something I share to anyone that's like listening to this and thinking about being a founder is like whatever you see in TechCrunch or whatever you see on Twitter, like know that there's an intent behind it, which is to market the startup. Like we do this too. <laughs> like it, it's it, the, you always want to have the perception of growth, growth, growth. And then the reality is like when you actually dig into any startup, it's a chaos on the inside. Because if you are growing really quickly, then um, you don't get the time to think about what is a perfect system that you can actually set up. You're just like trying to figure out how to grow. And then if you're not growing quickly, then you figure out like, well, how do we continue to accelerate the growth? And like, I think one thing that people say all the time is like building a startup is like a roller coaster. But I think the part maybe that's missed is like, well, the roller coaster emotions is like on a daily basis. It's not just on a monthly basis. One moment you can think like you close a deal. That's amazing. It's like, wow, that's so cool. We're amazing. And the next the next moment you're like, oh man, we lost this deal. Like this sucks. So you keep on going this day in and day out. And to your question of like, well, what do we attribute some of the success? I I honestly think it's all about the team. Um, because the you as a founder is just one person at the company. Um, what you need is like a team of really good people around you that can do everything else. And I think we've been really fortunate to be able to bring phenomenal people early on the pulley that can help us bring on other really good people. Because one of the things we say is like, well, A players bring A players, B hire C. And we're lucky that we have a lot of A players in the team so we can continue to accelerate kind of the talent that's sitting on the team too. Going back to your mentioning, um, sorry, I'm jumping around, but yeah. going back to like your mention of like uh, Jessica Livingston, like, it sounds like she was really impactful in like your life. And, you know, I, I'm assuming you went through YC, <laughs> YC when like the original founder yeah. was there where Jessica and Paul were there. And you went through three times. Like you probably have way more experience than most founders like going yeah. through the process. Like what was the best advice like Jessica could have given you and then maybe Paul and then, you know, uh, going through it many times. Like I'm sure there's like nuggets in your head for that. Yeah. Like, resonate for years like I think that one thing I, I felt like um uh Paul and Jessica were like exceptionally good at is and I think that they were actually almost irrationally founder friendly and I use the word irrational because there's probably financial decisions they made that were not in the interest of Paul and Jessica that were founder friendly um if you think about like where they spent their time they didn't I don't know, create a list of like, what is the company that's most like on paper, most likely to go and be successful is like, they really were so irrational and founder friendly to all founders is like, they probably spent far more time with me and my co-founder at the time on a startup that didn't go anywhere than they likely should have because they had so much conviction that maybe like you're, you're going to go figure something out. I would say like, it's not so much advice that they would give, but they give you the conviction that you can go and do something and you believe them because they've seen so many other founders be successful. Um, I think in, if we were to jump into like some of the tactics is like, 
Um, uh, YC, I think, is like drinking from a fire hose. And there's this period of time where you have a goal at the end, which is demo day. So like you need to make as much progress as possible for that timeline at the end. So it's such a strong forcing function to always be learning, always be growing, always be like shipping and doing something. And like, I, I try to actually take as much of that um, into pulley today because it's easy to maybe also get into a sense of complacency when you don't have that hard deadline. Like we always need to be growing because as a startup, it's like, if you're not growing, then you're stagnating or or you're dying is the, the other part. Yeah. And then you went through a second time, I guess they were still there. They were still there. The They're still there. So it was like the first time, I mean, the second time we went around, I think the second time it went, this was back in 2013. It was one of their last times running the, the YC batch. So this was like Paul and Jessica making chili and that was the dinners. And when I went through recently with Pulley in 2020, it was like, oh, wow, now it's like productionized. I don't say this in a mean way, but like more like when you have so many companies going through YC, it's obviously really different than when you're a smaller stage and Paul and Jessica can still make chili in a crock pot and serve it to all the founders too. Um, the uh, I think that um, uh, at that time, if I think about some of the differences, it was like uh, Paul was doing office hours and then um, only had like a couple other people that were supporting him. This time around, it's like you have partners that you can lean on that have a wealth of experience across different industries. And that I think is also incredibly helpful. Whenever I think any founder asks me, it was like, hey, is YC still valuable for like the 7%? That's really expensive. My answer usually is like, actually, I mean, it depends, but generally, yes, because like the value that they add um, to you as a founder is worth far more than 7% in equity. Your valuation is going to be higher based just from YC being able to participate. And I guess Stanford, like, I'm sure that had a huge impact also. Like what from Stanford? It sounds like you used Greg's service, which is crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. What did you use it for? Finding like apartment or... It, the um actually so let me think about it is like uh, I think I bought my bike out of off of SU host I found housing over the summer off of SU host and then probably also like found books that I didn't want to pay full price at the campus bookstore so if you connect those two things it's like housing transportation and basically education so like pretty critical uh, three bits of being at Stanford oh you're you're helping me achieve my mission of, of helping the Stanford community so. It's such a great community. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I think your your tool is uh, is a non-small part of my Stanford experience, Greg. Oh, I'm, I'm grateful for you sharing that. C could you talk about the recent $40 million uh, Series B raise with Founders Fund and, and how yeah, that- Yeah, definitely. So for us, like we raised funding from um, Founders Fund and then Stripe was also uh, a large participant within that as well. Um, Founders Fund is great. We we work with Keith Rabat at Founders Fund. And I was actually, I mean, if we're going to say we built for founders, what better firm to work with than Founders Fund? Um, the, the thesis, I think, for Founders Fund is basically go back to square one, which is focus on the people that you want to bet on, bet on the crazy founders with these ideas. Um, so for us, I think it's actually a really good partner in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of like the fund that we want to work with. And I would actually say specific to Keith, also a really good partner for us because uh, he's seen so many things. Uh, one of the things I think I really wanted in um, our first board member was someone that was not just an investor, but also had been an operator. Um, Keith Raval was like previously COO at, uh, at, what was it, at Square, and then was one of the co-founders at um, Open Door. And he actually is a CEO of a company, Open Store, today. Only question I have for him is like, how does he literally sleep? But um, the we wanted an operator um, in addition to an investor as well, because I think a lot of times you can have investors that give you a lot of advice, but unless you've been in the thick of it, it's really hard, I think, to take some of that advice because high level is saying, oh, you should do X, Y, and Z. And then in the thick of it is also really different. Like what is like the emotional toil that you sometimes go through of a team trying to like push this uh, big initiative through and how challenging it is. We want to make sure we had an investor that understood this because they've been in the weeds before as well. One really interesting thing, Greg, about Founders Fund, which I really think is cool is they really, really back the founder. And I don't think I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard in the yeah. history of Founders Fund, they've never fired a founder. Like they're on the board and they will never, they will always back the founder's crazy ideas, which is kind of awesome. Like from that perspective, like, you know, I think they've experienced that. Some of the original guys at Founders Fund, like uh, yeah. Peter Thiel or, you know, whoever else it is, they really wanted to back 
And I think that that's like actually like a really key part because like um like we know there's stories in which like founders have actually gone rogue. Um, uh, a lot of biotech founders seem to fit into that category. But at the same time, I think is like when you're trying to do something like such as building a company, in some ways, by definition, you're not trying to do what like in order to do something exceptional, you literally need to find the exception. And finding the exception could be it looks really, really messy in the middle. And then, oh, got it. This is what you need to do. And you need an investor that understands the messy middle part so you can get through on the other end too. So I guess a question for you, a lot of the founders out there, after their first company, they kind of burn out, right? This I've seen this a lot. Like founders are like, I'm done. Yeah. I don't want to do it again. Like you did it a second time. And then you said, I'm going to do it a third time. Yeah. Like most founders I've seen, like, just don't do that. Like why the second time and then a third time? Like that's very different. Yeah. But yeah. Honestly, I, I don't even know like why go and do it um, so many times. I mean, this is one of the parts where it's like, maybe I, uh, like same as dropping out of college. I'd say when I told my parents, they weren't super happy about the decision of like, Hey, I'm going to drop out. Um, but I also like think of it as like, um, I just kind of like it. I enjoy creating something when nothing exists. And um, Warren Buffett has a quote, which is like, you want to hop to work every single day. And if you're hopping to work every single day, then you don't feel burnt out. I think the reason that people burnt out is that they're working really hard at something that they don't actually want to get really good at. I think um, it's the case that creating something from the zero to one is incredibly hard, but then it's also some of the most rewarding things that you can do when you get your first sale, when you get your first sale, that's from someone you don't know. When you keep hitting like some of these milestones, you're like, wow. When I hear from people like you, Dan, of like, oh my goodness, like you're actually using poly and that's something you created. It's like such a high. So maybe for me, it's just the net of like, maybe for you too, Greg, it's like the case of like, when I talk about how much of an impact SU Posa had, that's why I think I, I keep going back. Like the highs are high. And then it's also a lot of really hard work. The uh, funny story there is like, I, when I went through um, uh, YC, I was pregnant with my first kid. And then when I was raising our subsequent round, I was pregnant with my second kid. So it's almost like every time there's like a, a big life moment as well. I think that like maybe having kids also gives you some perspective where like a serve is really hard. But then when I come home, like my son just wants to play with bubbles. Like that's all he cares about. I was like, okay, cool. There's also that mental reset I can do. Like, cool. We all want to start to be incredibly successful, but it's almost like you hold this dialectic in your head of like, I want to be incredibly successful. You also have to be okay that you are not guaranteed success because luck is absolutely huge part of that. Um, you can't control the macro environment. I would have hated to be a travel company when COVID hit. No one could have predicted COVID. So like being able to hold both, it was like, if you want to reach for the sky and the stars and like, maybe you're going to hit there and that'll be amazing. But if you don't, that's okay. I think we're all very fortunate to be positioned and that if I want to go work for a big tech company in the future, the opportunity is still there. I think maybe some of the opportunities to go and really take on massive risk and not care about like some of the downside um, is actually harder. Um, I think the further along your career, but maybe like contradicting myself, I would even say like, that could just be a mindset shift that if you're like a VP at a large company, you're like, man, do I actually want to go and be an intern again? If you're willing to say yes, then great. You, you absolutely have the founder mindset. Um, if it's actually harder for you to give that up and give up some of the prestige and certainty and the safety of being at a large company and knowing what your job is going to look like the next day and the next day, then maybe that's not it. But like, maybe you want to do that at a future point too. Yeah. I think that's a hard shift for people that want to work at startups. They think, oh, I could go work at a startup. It's easy. And then they're at a bar large company making a really great stable salary. Amazing. Yeah. It's hard to just say, oh, I'm going to take like one third the salary you know, I see that struggle with a lot of these people that want to work in startups and then they realize, oh, this is like hard and there's no support systems in place and I have to do this myself. You know, I think the mental aspect of the startup is actually a large part of it. Um, and when I say like the mental is like, it really is that emotional roller coaster. I, I think it's like, whereas like you really don't want your identity wrapped up into the success of any one company, like try your darn hardest. And if it's not successful, that's okay. We're like still like, I think in an incredibly fortunate position. So uh, to to relax. One of my um quirks is I, I really like to watch like 
shows that maybe you could say are really violent, like Narcos on Netflix. Because in my mind, it's like, man, if I don't feel at the start, nothing bad actually happens. If I am a drug lord and I fail at my drug empire, they all die. So um, the downside is obviously really capped too. Could you talk about your previous venture, Echo Lock Screen? Yeah. By Microsoft. And I know they became a, it became a key part of their Android strategy. And uh, how did that experience shape your approach to entrepreneurship and building fully? Um, so Echo was something that we built. And, and this is where I think like the path to doing a startup is never straightforward. Um, we, we came up with the idea for Echo, which was a smart lock screen for your Android phone. And this was back in like 2013 when Android was like really starting to blow up because of my experience running the company that we did before, which is the laundry delivery service. So the laundry delivery service, like when you're super scrappy as a startup, like you do everything as a founder. So my co-founder and I at the time were literally the ones doing the laundry and also doing the deliveries. So I'm already not a good driver. And when you're driving around San Francisco, like trying to drive up the hills and also pay attention to your phone, half the times you'll get alerts that are like, hey, this customer wanted to change their drop-off address. And have the other time was like, oh, you have a new Twitter notification. Um, after we ended up selling the uh, the laundry business to a private equity firm, um, we were like, man, like, what could we actually build that's next? And we're like, oh, that's interesting. Like, why don't we solve our own problem? Which is like, I would have loved if we had like priority inbox for our notifications in the same way that you have priority inbox for your emails. So then we ended up building um, Echo and we had chatted with uh, the team at Microsoft that was building a launcher for Microsoft. I was like, hey, there could actually be really good synergies there. So ended up um, working really closely with them. And then that's how we ended up also getting acquired as well. Uh, another question. So, okay, so you're at Poly. Poly is like I, probably your biggest success. I I'm assuming like it's a huge success. I use it. I'm sure lots of other startups use it. Like you're a growing founder in a successful startup. You have to grow as a person because this company is going to get big. Who knows? It's, you know, it's going to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, I heard Founders Club fund maybe has like support systems in place. Or do you have an executive coach? Is that something that like helps you grow as a person? Do you, have, do you hire a bunch of like really senior executives? It sounds yeah, like. I think it's like, I mean, I, to me, this is like the hard part and also like the really fun part. It's um, uh, there's a story that, huh, who was it? Um, I forgot his name, but he was a founder of Excite. Excite was like the OG search engine before Google. And he said, I used to believe that whenever I would raise the next round, all my problems would be solved. But he said, what I realized is that it's it's none of your problems are actually solved. Raising the next round is just a ticket into the harder, um, into a much harder race. It, it's like if you're, you think about it in terms of a sports analogy is like, great, you win at the regionals, then you advance to the state, and then you advance to nationals. And then you're at the Olympics. Your competition is so much harder. Now you're competing against literally the best people in the world. So um, I think about that in terms of like leveling yourself up as a founder, which is like your challenges get harder, but then you yourself is also like building up more of these skill sets so you can go and tackle them. Um, go and learn from people that have done it before. Uh, there's like other founders I reach out to that are staged before us. I was like, wait, how do you think about um, hiring your first executives? How do you actually interview for them? And I think one of the things you have to be really good at as a founder is to like be able to take that input and be able to process it really quickly and then go and take action on it. You're never going to be operating with high degree of certainty. Uh, there's so much ambiguity that you have. You need to go and make decisions constantly. But um, the the part of like being able to learn from others and done it, I think is, is oftentimes really useful too. Any like advisors or executive coaches like, I used to have an executive coach at my last company and they were very helpful. And I, I used to have this secret way of like hacking the system where I would be driving to work. This is pre COVID. I would drive, yeah. watch like any type of educational video to like learn about finance or like investment banking or just like management. Like, do you have hacks? Anything? Do you have hacks or any way like that you grow as a person? So a couple of things is like, um, I, I don't have an, a, um, I don't have an executive coach I actually just talked to one today. So maybe that's something I'll get the, uh, I think there's like, um, I'm hesitant to say like, well, what are some of the hats that I have? Because I think it's almost like, it can't be like a one size fits all. Some of the things I think I, I do try to do is like, I do read a ton. Um, one of the things I, I read from Naval is like, for some reason, when you go through school, you you are taught that you have to finish a book 
Why do you have to do that? Go and read the parts of the book that's actually relevant to you and come back and read the other parts that aren't. So um, being able to, I would say, skim a lot of things and process a high degree of information is very useful. The other is like, I think it goes back to the team part. Like um, Founders Fund and Keith is amazing. Like we work with them, but at the same time, like they're not thinking about poorly 24 seven. Me and my team, we're thinking about 24 seven. If I think about like maybe one of the deltas being a first time versus a second time founder is how much deference I would say practically that you give your investors. You realize that they don't have perfect clarity into what the future is and you understand far more of the business that they do. What you're relying on them for is pattern recognition. They see this type of problem across many different types of companies, can give you some advice on how you may think about solving it. But I would say a lot of the times is like, you need to know when to take the advice and when not to take that advice. One of the best pieces of advice I did get from like a former founder who's an investor within Pooley as well is like, before you ask someone for a piece of advice, you should actually ask them was like, do you have any experience in this area? Can you actually give me advice? Because really very rarely is someone actually going to hold back and say like, oh, sorry, I don't have any advice to give you. They're just going to give you that advice. You don't have any context on whether this person is even qualified to give you a piece of useful advice and could be led astray to. Could you talk about some of the most common misconceptions um, startups or, or founders have regarding equity management and how does Pooley address those? Yeah, I think that some of the things around um, equity that uh, may not be like super obvious is is actually like, a, I would say one of the key ones is that the more you give away, actually, the better it could be for you as a founder. Um, so a strong component of actually giving a lot of equity to your early employees, because they feel vested alongside you as future founders, or basically as like your group of your, your founding team that's growing the business as well. Um, doing a company, I think I really go back to this idea of it, it can't just be an end of one. Uh, building a company requires you to have really good people around you that feel invested into the future success. Um, I think another one that I think founders sometimes uh, uh, maybe over-optimize on is what the valuation of your company is. So I actually did this long tweet thread of like the valuation of your company like is only just one piece of it. There are there are so many other things that matter. So when you talk to investors, like um, some of the uh, some of the rights that investors could have actually could hurt your company in the future, when, like liquidation preferences. So understand when you're thinking about fundraising, like the fundraising as a whole, and actually not only the equity component. The third part I'd actually say that's actually pretty important is um, uh, equity matters for two things, economic upside. And the second one is control. So when you have a new, when you have a board for the first time, get a good lawyer to make sure that you understand what your board, uh, what the voting rights on this board will look like, because your boss is effectively your board. So being able to understand like, great, how do the voting rights end up splitting uh, between you and your different board members uh, matter for deciding like how does control um, uh, of your company end up playing out in the future? Because when things are going really well, everyone is aligned. It's when things aren't going well that you really need to make sure it's like you have the right set of people that's backing you too. Yeah, I think that's something that is um, really like new with through like a pulley is like understanding like these strange mechanisms. And I, I don't know if pulley, you know, is going to figure all of this stuff out because maybe AI and pulley can, but like, you know, liquidation preferences and like just other like mechanisms. Yeah. Investors have a lot of like interesting mechanisms that like they can use, you know, with founders, but question for you like all the billion dollar valuations out there do you feel like there there's a lot of structure and structure like i guess yeah you know structure means like complex terms that investors put in there to like make the investment more favorable for them sometimes i think uh, it really depends on the investor that you work with for and also i mean the flip side is like how much traction that you also have as a business uh, I mean, one of the products I think very unlikely that Pulley will get into is anything that I would say anything that promises a good outcome when it comes to fundraising. The reason is like I often get asked a lot of is like, hey, can you uh, how do you think about fundraising? How can we be better at fundraising? Ultimately, it's the thing that helps you the most when you're fundraising is like, how well is your company doing? The better your company is doing, the easier it is to fundraise for that next round. So uh, you have more leverage if your company is doing well versus when your company isn't doing that well. And it's also the case that like not fundraising could actually be by far the best fit. I actually don't think it's the case that most businesses need to fundraise venture funding. When you're doing venture funding, there's like a very specific um, type of business and growth trajectory that you sign up for. I think the founder of Calendly is, um, uh, didn't actually go and um, fundraise, wasn't able to fundraise for his company. And that's probably ended up being far better for them because he ends up owning more of the company and they're doing very well today. 
Could you talk about some of your favorite failures, um, experiences that you've had that felt like a failure at the time, but ended up being a, a good thing for you or you, you learned an important lesson? I think they like, man, um, the, uh, if the, the reason I would like maybe even hesitate to, when I'm thinking about failures is not that I haven't failed. I feel like you fail all the time, but it's almost like this framing that I would have is like, it doesn't even matter if you fail as long as you learn something from it. And that to me, isn't even a failure. It's just like, great, cool. You learned something. It's like, how do I apply that next time? Um, the, uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, being interviewing, uh, someone, Okay, so here's one of the examples. I think when you're building Pooley, um, it's the case for almost all founders. It's like you're required to hire people in roles that you've never done. And it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to hire the right people across every single role. So great. We've also brought on folks to the team that weren't a good fit. And I think a key learning for us is figuring out like, why wasn't a good fit? How do we think about um, uh, learning from this next time so we can find the right people? And then the other is like, how do you actually respond if someone is not a great fit for your team? And um, and and how do you correct that as well? I think another, if I think about like uh, things that didn't go well, um, man, there's so many startup lessons I actually take away was one of the uh, uh, pivots I'd done uh, coming out of Stanford was this disappearing text message product. So we had, um, uh, at the time, Snapchat was just getting off the ground. We knew about them fairly early. We were like, no, we don't want to do just spring photos. I would be copying them. Now have no qualms, fast copy, go and do it. Others would be like, you go and pick a market that's too small. I actually did a whole startup school talk about like, here's like 10 failures that we had throughout the lifetime of all the companies I've done and what we actually ended up learning from them. You have to be incredibly comfortable with failures. If not, I would say like being at a startup is probably not the right fit because like, I feel like I'm just failing every single day because like going back to this example of like the game gets harder. Well, the only way that you can maybe make fewer mistakes is like if you've done something on repeat, it's just second nature, but that's just not a startup game. Got it. Yeah, no, they, they, all of this was amazing feedback. Yeah, and I guess um, since we're coming up at the top of the hour, curating the team, one thing I noticed about your team is they're extremely positive. And this is another reason why I love working with your team. Like you're setting the culture. I see it. Yeah. Like, you're positive. You understand failure is like important, but like what's your... Give us it like a preview into like why police team is so positive and like what are you setting like is are you curating like I guess interviewing people and finding the right people there I and mean, you can't hire everyone perfectly but like you're clearly hiring the right people people are extremely motivated like what is it about like what is the culture there that's making it so like win it's like winning you know there's yeah. a lot of things out there that are losing maybe it's the culture maybe it's the market but like you're doing something really right with your culture like. Give us a preview into like the hiring. Is, yeah, I think it's a great question to kind of maybe end this out on as we're wrapping up. This is a part where I would say is like a uh, lesson learned from previous company is like you got to be your full self when it comes to creating the culture that you wanted to start up. Trying to be someone else doesn't work because Google can say there's something for everyone because there are 100,000 people. I don't even know how many people, but just massive as a company. You need to go and create a culture that works for thousands of people. That's not the case at a startup. Um, the case at a startup is one where like you just need to hire like 10 people. When you're first starting out, you need to hire just five people. Rather than trying to dilute what your culture is, you should lean into the things that make you different. So at Pooley, what we actually say is like, we're not a family. We're closer to high performance sports teams. There is There are a lot of startups that say like, well, we're a family and, and all of that. The reason we say we're not a family is in my mind, um, you can't let go of someone that is uh, in your family. If my partner makes a meal that's not great, I'm not giving them 10 pointers on what can you do better next time. Um, I'm just like actually kind of grateful for the actual support. But as a team, if we didn't hit our goals, we need to be held accountable. We need to do a retro. And great, if there's performance issues, we need to really consider that on the team. So I think that for, for us, like initially when we were starting, it was like, man, like there's a lot of startups that say like there's a family vibe, kumbaya. That's not pulley. That's okay. Lean into the things that actually make you really different than rather trying to be like everyone else. Like going back to this like common saying, like if you want to do something exceptional, you literally have to find the exception. Being different is also what allows you to do that too. What's the biggest lesson you've learned in your entrepreneurial journey and, and what advice would you give to, to young founders? 
my as a young founder, is just go, go jump in. There's a massive difference. There's only so much that you can go and read about doing the startups. This is like um, you sitting on the sidelines watching a basketball court, basketball game. If you never shot a basketball, like there is nothing that replaces jumping in, trying to actually build a business. Um, we attract a lot of people that apply to Pooley that want to be future founders. And that's awesome. And at the same time, like I'm really excited for some of these folks to go and start their own company because I know there'll be nothing like the accountability that they face once they actually try to do the zero to one and realize how hard it is. I think for young founders, you just got to jump in. You got to give it a try. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. You can take on the risk when you're young, especially. Um, so go and do it because otherwise uh, I think it's hard to learn what it's like to be a founder. Awesome. I know we're um, up at the top of the hour again. Uh, this was amazing. This talk was amazing. So uh, thank you so much for doing it. And uh, I know you're busy. You have, you know, family and, and running an amazing, successful startup. And I appreciate you taking the time with me and Greg today. So uh, absolutely. Well, it was really great to chat with, with you guys. And yeah, um, uh, enjoy the conversation. Yeah.